unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to the first episode of Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Hindustan Times and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav of the Carnegie Endowment. For our weekly roundup of the latest and greatest in Indian politics, I'm joined today by Sukumar Ranganathan, editor-in-chief of the Hindustan Times, and Sadhanand Dume, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Sukumar Sadhanand, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Good to be here. Thank you, Milan. Good to be here. I want to jump right into it. Early this morning, India time, India executed a targeted military strike against Jaishi Muhammad terrorist camps in Pakistan. The attacks were in response to the Valentine's Day attack on a convoy of vehicles carrying Indian paramilitary officers in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, in which at least 40 soldiers lost their lives and many more were injured. Jaishi Muhammad, which is a terrorist organization which finds safe haven in Pakistan, quickly took responsibility for the attack. Now, as of now, Pakistan has promised retaliation, but we don't know what form of response, if any, uh, will take. So, Sukumar, let me start with you. Tell us, what do we know right now about the Indian strikes and help characterize for us the mood right now in New Delhi? The, I'll start with the mood uh, because that's easier. Uh, the mood is uh, definitely upbeat, uh, but it is not uh, triumphalist. I, I, I think it's a very considered mood. Um, I'm sure uh, you must have listened to the Foreign Secretary's uh, press conference this morning and the statement that came out. Uh, It was a very nuanced, matter-of-fact, professional statement which uh, avoided the term retaliation and instead spoke about a preemptive strike on a non-military target, which also happens to be Um, non-civilian. It's a base of a non-state actor. So and, and I think uh, this is going to be India's position, that it acted on the basis of actionable intelligence on a non-military and non-civilian target um, to prevent further suicide attacks. So it is a very considered mood that you have here. Uh, most government ministers who, who are usually uh, very gung-ho about such things uh, have been pretty muted in their response. Uh, the opposition has uh, uh, supported what has happened. Uh, they've been briefed by the government. Um, but again, they've not issued uh, lengthy statements about how they feel. Uh, the mood on the street is a little more celebratory. In some parts of the country, people have actually uh, taken to the streets and uh, uh, celebrated this attack. But again, it, it, it's not it's not one of those... Uh, huge thing. So, so I think people are, in general, satisfied that this has happened, uh, but, but the reaction is muted. Uh, and in some quarters, it's also uncertain because the, the services are prepared for a possible retaliatory action from Pakistan. Uh, there is uncertainty in some quarters whether this might happen. Uh, the stock markets are nervous. Uh, they fell sharply in the morning before recovering in the evening because uh, they worried that uh, there might be a retaliatory action by Pakistan. So uh, overall, positive mood, but a little tentative. Sukumar, talk to us a little bit about you know what the domestic implications of this attack are, given that it has occurred on the eve of national elections. We're likely just you know a couple of weeks away from the announcement of the, the official election dates. Um, Play this out for us. How is this going to affect the 2019 race as things stand today? I, I think it will have some impact on the election, but in fact, actually a significant impact on the elections. Um, I, I'd like you. I'd like to take you back three weeks um, before the attack in Pulwama took place, and and back then, uh, if you had to characterize the political situation, I think it would have been an accurate assessment to say that the momentum appeared to be with the Congress Party in some ways. Uh, not to make a huge recovery from a dismal response, uh, a dismal performance in the last election, uh, but to do much better and to actually give the BJP a fight in uh, many, many locals of our constituencies. Uh, but I think what has happened now with this uh, strike uh, is, the, is that the government seems to have regained some of the momentum. I, I, I think... Uh, uh, and, and this, again, is, is, is in some ways a reflection of what was happening in many parts of the country, uh, because 
uh, we, we have reporters across the country and, and uh, the kind of articles, the kind of uh, stories that we were getting from them uh, when uh, the reminds of these um, uh, CRPF troopers who were killed in the suicide attack by going back home uh, spoke of spontaneous crowds that would gather uh, with patriotic slogans uh, rending the air. And, and, and I think the mood was uh, one that called for some retaliatory action by the Indian government. And I think this is going to be seen as that. Um, and, and, and it will obviously help uh, the BJP, um, which can obviously, and rightfully, since it's the government in power, uh, take claim, take credit for whatever has happened. So let me... uh, the unfortunate thing from the opposition's perspective is that uh, they really can't seem to be attacking this. Uh, because to attack this would be to attack uh, the services, the Air Force, to attack this uh, would be to question the right of a country uh, to strike when there is a, a threat, a, an imminent threat um, that is perceived. Uh, so I think it, it puts the opposition in a strained kind of position. It, it puts the government in a good position. So I think uh, the needle has swung a little bit towards the government and could help it in the elections. So let me quickly sort of uh, mostly agree but slightly disagree. I mean, first of all, I would say that at this point, um, I would say the needle has probably swung much more than just a little, right? I mean, this is, if if this set of facts holds, this is quite dramatic. Uh, this is, uh, you know, just going by the media narrative, going by how this is being portrayed, going by, by, by the huge rally behind the flag effect, the fact that Modi did not turn the other cheek and that this response is so dramatically different from India's response to the Mumbai attacks, all of that plays very well for the BJP. The one caveat I'd add is that these, you know, the circumstances are very fluid. Uh, if we freeze this frame, it looks good for the BJP uh, for all the reasons that, that, that Sukumar listed. Um, however, you can imagine a situation where things escalate, right? We don't know how Pakistan is going to play this. We don't know whether between now and election day there are going to be a series of, God forbid, more terrorist attacks. And so I think that, you know, we, we this is an extremely fluid situation. I just want to say that we don't know what things are going to look like uh, two months from now when people actually vote. Definitely. And, and I would agree completely with that because uh, I'll a, a lot of things, a lot of it actually depends on what Pakistan will do now and, and, and whether and how India chooses to respond to that. So it, it could well be that you have um, something that spirals out of control and, and uh, no one has any idea how that is going to impact um, what is going to happen in the elections. And you're right. I, I think a good way to look at it would be to say that if you were to freeze things at this moment, who benefits? And, and from that perspective, the BJP does benefit if you freeze things at this moment. Uh, Sukumar, I want to ask you what this means for things in Jammu and Kashmir. I mean, pre, uh, prior to this retaliation, uh, if we can call it that, many Indian al analysts criticized the Modi government's approach in the state, arguing that the BJP's role in the state government, uh, it was a part of the state government until recently, has deepened as opposed to healed cleavages uh, in this troubled state of Jammu and Kashmir. How do you see the politics playing out in that particular state? This is a tough question. I mean, I mean it's definitely not as tough as uh, um, the, the situation the government faces in JNK, but it's very tough to answer, and, I, and I'll tell you why. I, I think it's because um, no Indian government has ever had a consistent policy on JNK, um, irrespective of what the policy may be. Now, if you adopt, adopt the so-called Iron Hand policy and you decide... Um, as we've seen in recent days, that, that you're going to clamp down on uh, uh, separatist groups, you're, you're actually going to detain some of them, you're going to arrest some of them and move them out of the state, uh, you're going to move uh, uh, more uh, police forces into the state and uh, uh, increase security and, and uh, increase the number of checks that you have, um, then, then I think you have to be consistent in that. And at some point in time, when you believe that the threat perception is reduced or the threat is reduced, you also have to build bridges with the local populace. Or you take the other approach, which is uh, you reach out uh, to local people, especially young people, that you find out what's happening, which is the classic interlocutor model which all governments have tried, I mean, including the NDA most recently. But 
but but I think the problem is um, uh, no government has been consistent with either policy. So so right now you actually have uh, a tinderbox in JNK where where you've had a series of attacks. You you've had uh, uh, local youth who have been uh, radicalized and uh, um, in some cases with uh, the support of terror groups such as the Jaish and the Lashkar, uh, which are proscribed terror groups, but but which still. Uh, operate with some degree of freedom and impunity in the valley, and um, it, it 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 really resulted in a situation where there are, I think, uh, no credible voices that are left in the valley. Uh, you, the national conference, uh, has some amount of following, but it doesn't have a huge following. Uh, the PDP has lost a lot of credibility after it allied with the BJP. Uh, the BJP's uh, policy on JNK is, is uh, very, very different uh, from what uh, at least some part of the state wants. I mean, I mean as part of uh, many of their manifesto statements in the past, you, you've had uh, Section uh, 370 and Article 35A, uh, which, which are articles that uh, which are parts of the Constitution that give the state some degree of autonomy, and, and they speak about repealing those acts. Uh, so I think you have no credible voices. Uh, you have terror groups that are radicalizing local people. Uh, you don't have a consistent policy uh, by the central government. And at this point in time, you don't have an elected government in place. So, so um, I don't think things can get any worse. So, so the, the short answer to your question is uh, I, I don't think these attacks are going to make things any worse or any better. And as for the... Uh, longer solution to JNK. I, I, I just think you'll have to address some of the things that I mentioned. So I want to end this news roundup by asking each of you to share with our listeners, you know, one story coming out of India this past week that you think has not been adequately covered, uh, but we need to pay attention to. So Dhanan, let me start with you. So to me, the big story is what's going on with the economic statistics in India. Uh, this is obviously not a sexy story because, I mean, in the end, you know, your eyes glaze over, right, GDP growth, how do you calculate it, and so on. Um, but I think that what's happened, we've seen a couple of, you know, high-profile resignations from a statistical commission. And I think that India is going into, you know, in, in the old days, used to the, 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 what people would say about statistics is that, you know, the Chinese would cook the books and Indian statistics weren't always that great, but no one was you know, out to out to cook them. Um, I think that, you know, the good news is that Indian politicians now care about GDP growth. Uh, the bad news is that Indian politicians now care about GDP growth. And that's <laughs> a story that I wish that was, you know, getting more attention. Sukumar, what about you? What should we be paying attention to that we're not adequately? Um, I'm, I'm actually going to move far away from uh, politics and economics, not, not politics entirely, but uh, uh, quite some distance from politics. And, and I think uh, one story that's actually not got enough coverage is this huge forest fire that's happening uh, in the southern part of India. And, and, and between 10,000 and 17,000 acres of uh, forest land have been burnt in, in one of the uh, most biodiverse uh, forest lands uh, left in the country. It's called the Bandipur uh, Reserve. It's, it's uh, in Karnataka. And uh, it, it, it's in some ways uh, symptomatic of what's happening in this country because uh, it, it's probably a human-made fire. Uh, may have been started by uh, forest dwellers who are trying to uh, um, practice slash and burn agriculture, or it could have been started by someone else, but it's definitely started by humans, and, and the weather's been particularly dry, so, so you've had uh, significant loss of uh, habitat, significant loss of animal life, and, and I don't think it's getting as much traction as it should get, because as extreme weather events change. And one reason why it's so dry in Karnataka is because the northeast monsoon in uh, uh, the southern part of the country almost fa failed last year. Um, and um, it's, it's extremely dry. And, and, and as extreme weather events increase, or the frequency of extreme weather events increase, you'll probably see more of those. I wish uh, there was more coverage of that. We've been doing our bit, but, but I think especially now, given what's happened with the strikes and <laughs> how everyone's really focused on... Uh, uh, the strikes on Pakistan. I'm, I'm sure this is one story that's going to get buried. So we like to end each news roundup uh, every week by asking our guests who had the best week in India and who had the worst week. Sadanand, who had the best week? I think clearly the best week was Narendra Modi. Uh, this, uh, you know, this, these, these strikes, the fact that the entire national debate has switched, has 
move towards this. He gets to showcase his muscularity, puts the opposition in a, in a tough spot. They don't know how to criticize him without looking as though they're also criticizing the armed forces. Uh, he's clearly had the best week in India. Who had the worst week? Well, I think the the ob- obviously the opposition. I would say that you know Rahul Gandhi, who looked like he was gaining some uh, certain amount of momentum, and uh, now really has to go back to the drawing board. Sukumar, who had the best week? Who had the worst week? I I would have to agree entirely with Stan. And, um, I, I think uh, Narendra Modi had the best week, not just because of the strike, but also because his party uh, finalized alliances in uh, two uh, very very important states, Maharashtra as well as uh, Tamil Nadu. Um, the opposition alliance is on in some states, off in some states, and, and the grand alliance that they've spoken of hasn't happened. And like Sadhanan said, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to criticize the government on the strikes without looking as if they're criticizing the armed forces. So, so I think uh, the opposition has had the worst week. Narendra Modi has had the best week. Sukumar Sadhanan, thanks for being here. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, you'll hear my interview with Arvind Subramaniam on a universal basic income for India. I'm pleased to be joined today by Arvind Subramaniam. From 2014 to 2018, Arvind served as the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, which is one of the most important economic policy positions in the government. Each year at the time of the Indian budget, the government releases a document called the Economic Survey, which is India's annual flagship economic policy statement. It's no exaggeration to say that Arvind transformed what had been a rather dense government report into a lively, vibrant think piece on the most important questions in Indian political economy. He's currently a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics in Washington, D.C. He joins us today on the phone from Boston. Thanks for coming to the podcast, Arvind. Uh, Great to be with you, Milan. So, Arvind, I want to start with one of the issues that you examined in the economic survey back in 2017-2018, which was this idea of a universal basic income for India. You know, the idea of a UBI has sort of become the flavor of the month in policy circles. You know, it's being debated everywhere from Silicon Valley to East Africa to uh, Finland. But it's also become a major election year issue in India, as both the Congress and the BJP have sort of unveiled proposals for a UBI as centerpieces of their respective 2019 campaigns. So before we kind of get into that debate, I just want to take a step back and ask you two really simple but I think fundamental questions for those who haven't been following closely. Number one, what is a UBI? And number two, what is the motivation behind this policy measure? Right. Uh, the UPI, I think, has three uh, core tenets, universality, unconditionality, and agency. So essentially, the government would transfer a, a certain sum of money, a, a basic income, uh, which would be available to all, hence universal. It would not be attached to, you know, uh, households that received receive them, you know, fulfilling some uh, condition. For example, in Mexico, uh, when the Progresa scheme was in, uh, instituted, uh, women had to go and ensure that uh, the children got immunized uh, uh, before they got the transfer. Uh, in, in the UBI case, there's no such condition, so uh, you get it regardless. And third, it's in the form of cash, and that confers agency on households because the government doesn't tell you what to spend the money on, households are free to, uh, to, uh, to decide what they want to spend it on. So, so these are the three key, I think, features of a UBI. Now, why is it attractive at this point in time? I think, you know, uh, the motivations vary across the world. In Silicon Valley, it's something. In, in East Africa, it's something else. But in the case of India, I think uh, the motivations are twofold. Uh, first, I, I think uh, the, the kind of uh, belief that uh, no person in India should be without a, a certain amount uh, of money so that he or she can, you know, uh, uh, live a life that you know isn't dominated by poverty, misery, you know, all the psychological burdens that come with that. I, I think that that kind of broad moral principle. But then uh, it comes on top of the fact that, you know, anti-poor programs, you know, programs by the government to eliminate poverty have usually not been as successful as they ought to have been. So a kind of disenchantment with anti-poverty programs 
uh, coupled with uh, you know the tantalizing prospect that a UBI can in one fell swoop kind of bypass the whole administrative machinery that's geared to anti-poverty programs and just send a check directly to household bank accounts. So that's kind of the excitement of the kind of the practical excitement uh, that comes with the UBI. So I, I want to get into some of the specifics about the experiments that are occurring in India and some of the new proposals that the parties have, have uh, rolled out in advance of the elections. But before we do that, you know, when you wrote your survey in 2017, you actually don't propose a universal basic income. You propose something called a quasi-universal basic income, and that's really where much of the debate is in India today. So what is the difference between these two things? Yeah, uh, I, I think that when we wrote it, uh, you know, I certainly felt uh, that for two reasons, uh, the ideal of universality is kind of appealing, but in practice, I think two uh, factors would kind of uh, come in the way of achieving universality, and that's why, uh, you know, for example, I think the politics in India is such that, you know, the notion that a lot of rich people will also get money from the state, uh, I think that would be kind of anathema uh, from a from a po- political point of view. So, so that's why I think keeping, you know, some non-deserving rich, as it were, out of it uh, would, would, would be a prerequisite for implementing such a scheme. And the second, of course, is fiscal cost. These things are not going to be cheap. So if, uh, you know, you can keep out some portion of the population, not a large portion, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent, that are demonstrably, you know, doing well or well off, uh, you then kill two birds with one stone. You know, the politics becomes uh, easier to, to, to overcome. And second, the fiscal costs also go down because you have to give it to, you know, 75 or 80 percent of the population rather than the entire population. So, you know, when you first raised the idea of this quasi-UBI, you wrote the following, and I want to quote, the irresistible force of even as powerful an idea as a UBI will run into the immovable object of a resistant, pesky reality, um, seeming to signal the political economy complications of implementing such a program. However, Today in India, there are at least two experiments currently underway which represent two different forms of UBIs, one in the state of Telangana, one in the state of Odisha. What have these states decided to do, and how has it been going so far? Well, uh, I think uh, what has really changed in the last, um, I would say, a year almost. Remember, we wrote this in February 2017, and it kind of informed and it caught fire in the political uh, uh, debates and policy debates in India, but for about a year or so just languished uh, and remained a kind of interesting idea that people were kind of debating. Uh, but then what happened, what changed everything was, uh, you know, kind of agrarian crisis in India. O- as you know, over the last uh, four seasons or five agricultural seasons, that's two and a half years, what has happened is that agricultural prices uh, outside rice and wheat, the cereal sector, have collapsed, and farm incomes have also collapsed correspondingly. So, so the political there's, big, there's a lot of now, or there was a lot of accumulating political pressure to respond to this agrarian crisis, and that was the political opportunity seized by, as you said. Uh, the Chief Minister of Telangana and then the Chief Minister of Odisha. The first scheme, the Chief Minister of Telangana, what he did was to say that I will send a, a certain amount of money per you know, uh, acre uh, 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 twice a year, that's for, for, for every agricultural season, uh, to all the landed farmers because you know, the crisis was seen as agrarian, so you needed to be seen to be you know, responding to farmer concerns. And therefore, Telangana said, well, if you're a farmer with land, you will get a, a certain amount of money, I think it was 5000 per acre per season. Uh, and so the more land you had, the more money you got. But that was the first experiment. And the second experiment uh, was by another eastern state, uh, Odisha, which basically said that, you know, this is kind of a little bit unfair because uh, in the agricultural sector, you not only have landed farmers, but you have much poorer uh, tenant farmers and landless laborers, and they've been eaten up by the agrarian crisis, so we should you know, help them as well. And so uh, Odisha extended the scheme to them. But what 
re- what makes both these schemes retain the flavor of a UBI is that once you identify the beneficiaries, which of course is going to be quite difficult, they get you know a cash transfer to their bank accounts, and that's what kind of makes it a, a, a universal basic income type of scheme, even though it's not doesn't strictly fulfill all the conditions of a UBI. So now we've entered the kind of campaign season in India. You know, everyone is gearing up to kind of unveil their platforms, their policies, their agendas. You know, if if either the BJP are brought back to power or the Congress or the opposition were to come to power. A few days before the budget, the Congress president, Rahul Gandhi, uh, said that if the Congress were brought to power in 2019, it would implement a minimum income support scheme for all deserving Indians. Now, we don't have very many details about the program but as I understand it, the Congress would essentially give a UBI for, well, it's again a quasi-UBI because it's to poor households, but it would operate on a sliding scale. Uh, is that right, that not everyone would get the same size, but it would vary on uh, on the basis of the wealth of the household? Yeah, see, uh, now, I think we need to step back and say that um, – this Congress proposal is like minimum income guarantee for, uh, I think, the poor. It's called uh, poor or deserving or whatever. I think in spirit, it is not quite a UBI because uh, a UBI in, in principle says, you know, you don't need to find anyone. You just give it to anyone. In the quasi university that I propose, you still retain that flavor because you don't have to identify any target groups. You just have to identify who can be kind of kept out of it. You exclude out. The Congress proposal, I think, retains the flavor of the old anti-poverty programs by saying we want to find uh, the poor or the deserving and then send the money to them. So in that sense, I don't think it's quite gone uh, in the direction of capturing the true spirit of, of a UBI. So that's the first point. The second point is what you raise, uh, which, again, the details are not clear. Uh, it, it seems to be kind of, you know, a super uh, micromanaged. It's almost as if it's not just that you say, here are the poor, we give them money, but then you say, no, within the poor, I can, you know, kind of make out how much, how poor you are, and depending on that, we, the government, will make up the shortfall. So it seems like fairly demanding in terms of how much information you require and fairly interventionist in terms of how you're going to provide the money. You're going to identify, you know, lots of households. You're going to calculate how, how kind of, what the current income is, and then you say you have a target income that's X, and however much they're short of X, everyone gets that money, and that will, of course, vary across how so it seems like it's super demanding in terms of uh, administrative resources, in terms of data, in terms of implementation. So in that sense, I, I, my own view is that it doesn't quite capture the spirit of a UBI and is much more in the spirit of the old anti-poverty programs. Now, the government, for its part, announced in the budget uh, something that's, I guess, closer to the ideal UBI or quasi-UBI, in that they announced a guaranteed income scheme for farmers on a nationwide basis. Um, And they are doing that with retrospective effect to try to get the first payments out before election starts. In fact, I think the first payments are going to be coming as early as next week, right? End end of this month. End of this month. How how does their scheme, how do you rate their scheme? Well, I think their scheme seems, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, demonstrably modest uh, in its uh, scope uh, uh, because uh, on the one hand, you have uh, the Odisha, the Telangana scheme, which is all landed farmers. Uh, the uh, Odisha scheme is much more comprehensive because it covers uh, landed farmers, tenant farmers, and landless laborers. But the government scheme, I think, focuses only on kind of the lower end uh, of the landed farmer distribution. It says that only those with, you know, two and a half or less land, uh, acres of land, will get this amount. So it seems to be, in that sense, a more... Uh, kind of progressive or, you know, targeting the very poor, as it were. Um, And and so it's kind of a little bit also, I'm not sure, 
uh, it, it really does uh, go in the direction of a of an ambitious UBI because a few small farmers uh, will will get this uh, uh, this this money. So. Uh, it, it seems like a fairly modest proposal, in, in my view. I mean, so you had a piece, Arvind, in the Financial Times, that, and we'll link to that on the show page, where you unveiled your preferred option, which you called a QBRI, a quasi-universal basic rural income. And as I understand it, you can correct me if I'm wrong, basically under your proposal, you know, say 75% of all rural households, uh, obviously that exact percentage might vary, but not just farmers of rural households, would get a cash transfer that would top off their income, and this would be a flat transfer to every poor rural household. Is that right? Yeah. So so, uh, so what we were trying to do was the following, right? I mean, the political opportunity, as we discussed, was created by the agrarian crisis. So whatever scheme that one had to put forward, because that's what uh, the political process was doing, you know, as you know, Telangana and Odisha were putting forward proposals to respond to this agrarian crisis. So we had to be mindful that our proposal had to be uh, in that spirit. And, and given that we thought the farm crisis encompasses also, uh, you know, non-farm but rural households because everyone is caught up in this agrarian crisis. That's why we said let's go, let's not restrict it to agriculture and farmers, but to all rural households uh, for this reason. The second reason we did that was also because um, it, uh, what it allows us to do is to get away from uh, the complex and really fiendishly difficult task of identifying. Remember, the prob- there are two problems with the Telangana and the Odisha scheme. You've got to find who's a landed farmer or who's not. And uh, believe me, in India, the land titling, land records titles are uh, you know really uh, not exactly easy to come by. So just to identify who has land and how much, it's just very, very difficult to do. So our proposal by saying uh, all rural households also just involve having to exclude people rather than find all the uh, intended beneficiaries. So that's why we said you know quasi-universal. Uh, and of course, the last thing why we said all rural households was that the Telangana scheme, for example, or even loan waivers, tend to be highly regressive. Uh, Those who get loans are uh, generally the rich who borrow from the official system. Landed farmers are generally uh, amongst the richer part of the spectrum in rural India. Uh, And so it it, it turns out these become very regressive schemes. So that's why we wanted to say no. We wanted to make it more progressive and give all households uh, the same amount so that it becomes much more progressive. Uh, So so administration-wise, responding to the political crisis, and, of course, fiscal costs, Cost-wise, uh, our proposal seemed to kind of, uh, you know, square all these, you know, kind of tie up all these objectives. So let's just get into this question of populism for a second, because, you know, the first question that obviously comes to mind is, you know, how are you going to pay for this, right? So that's number one. And I think number two is, and you somewhat alluded to this, is, you know, there have been skeptics who have criticized your proposal and, frankly, other UBI proposals as serving as some kind of a pretext for cutting important social programs that the poor in India rely on. So how do you think about the cost and the substitution effect? Yeah, so I think that, you know, um, at least the proposal that we uh, we put on the table here, we've said it'll cost something like, you know, somewhere less, uh, less than one and a half percent of GDP. And we've actually identified, you know, existing subsidies which are highly regressive, highly inefficient, and also, frankly, uh, you know, devastating environmentally uh, and ecologically uh, and health-wise are ones that need to be cut. For example, the fertilizer subsidies is about, uh, you know, 0.4, 0.5% of GDP. I think that can be cut. Interest rate subsidies for farmers, which basically, again, don't reach poor farmers, that can be cut. So there are a whole bunch of, you know, schemes in agriculture itself which can pay for uh, 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 the kind of universal basic income quasi that that we've advocated, but that's the the, the other thing I would say, and, and I'll come back to your point at the end, it, and which because it's important to highlight this, is the interesting thing about any such scheme in India, Milan, as you know, is that it's not just 
you know, either the center or the states that are going to be implementing this, uh, it should and probably will be done by them coming together and acting together. That's why our proposal says 50% to be financed by the center and 50% to be financed by the states. And, and so if states, you know, given that they've seen the political popularity of this, and given that they have hard fiscal constraints, if they want to kind of uh, earn that political popularity, then they will have to make some hard choices, um, or, or else they forego, you know, uh, reaping the benefits that telling on it. So, so the fact that there are hard budget, hard budget constraints on the states, I think, should help in making uh, this financeable by eliminating some of the, you know, less useful, more regressive, and wasteful subsidies. So, I think at the scale that we're proposing it, I think it does not have to come at the expense. And this is where your anxiety comes in. You know, it will, it should not in the first instance come at the expense of, you know, the food, the cheap food subsidy program that we have or the employment guarantee scheme that we have. You know, these are seen as vital parts of the current safety net. And I don't think that in the initial stages we should touch those because, A, I don't think that's, that's going to happen uh, because politically that will be very unpopular, uh, but also because you don't need to. You can find other ways of, you know, financing the money. But in the long run, uh, you know, is there any guarantee that uh, uh, this will, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, become yet another scheme w with more money thrown uh, at it, you know, undermining public finances all over the country? I mean, there's no cast iron guarantee against that. Um, uh, we just have to, you know, keep our fingers crossed to some extent and hope that uh, uh, much of this can be financed from within the existing uh, uh, budgetary envelopes. But I mean, getting beyond cost here to the, to the to the questions about implementation, you know, your scheme and other schemes, I think, intrinsically rely on uh, the biometric identification, uh, the Aadhaar program, the ability for India to process mobile payments so that people can receive payments, you know, using their mobile phone without having to go to a physical bank. Um, that they have adequate access to, you know, uh, the banking system in the first place. Uh, is this infrastructure honestly up to the task uh, of, of what you, of the burdens that, that you would be placing on it? So, uh, you know, today I think honestly uh, many states probably do not have uh, this kind of plumbing or infrastructure uh, that would get the money to, you know, or, uh, you know, what, whoever we want to get the money to. Uh, I, I think we're still uh, short of that. But I think we've made a lot of progress in the last three, four years. I mean, if you look at the number of financial accounts that have been open, if you look at the coverage of the biometric program, the spread of mobile phones, I think we're kind of rapidly making a progress on that. And the other thing to remember, Milan, here is that some of the existing programs, like the food subsidy and the employment guarantee, are in fact using that same infrastructure that, you know, we would need to use for direct transfer. So, uh, uh, so, so it's not as if this would have to start a fresh de novo. Uh, there's already some stuff uh, out there. And when we're thinking about, you know, uh, is it going to cover everyone? How quickly? What is the financial access? Which are all very important questions. I think we need to keep in mind, uh, uh, always remind ourselves that we're asking, you know, compared to what. I mean, if the alternative to this is a program that requires a lot of targeting, you know, all kinds of things, uh, you know, those programs will probably be even more difficult uh, than what uh, if something like a UBI will encounter. Uh, so, so we're making progress. I, I think uh, it's within reach. I think over the next uh, one or two years, especially, you know, remember that once you announce such a program and you create expectations, there will also be concomitant pressure to kind of deliver on the promise. So it can also kind of organically and, and endogenously increase the efforts to improve the plumbing or the infrastructure. So on this, I, I, I'm, you know, we're not there, but I'm hopeful that we can get there over a reasonable uh, period of time. Arvind, it's been a delight to have you on the podcast. We look forward to tracking India's UBI in this political season through your commentary and your analysis. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, Melania. Grant Damasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jamie Hinson and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin's our audio engineer, and Lauren Duax, our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.